good evening. It's good to see each one of you tonight. We welcome you out to the service for the Lord. It's a real privilege for us to have the doors with us tonight. Micah and Jillian and their family, beautiful children, beautiful family. And we are thrilled and delighted to have you with us tonight. It's a real blessing. Well, we're glad you're here. We're going to begin singing this evening, lifting our voices to the Lord, praising Him. Think of the special music this morning. I will sing praises to Him, and that's what we're here to do. So let's begin with 445, 445, standing on the promises of Christ my King. Why don't we stand together, lift our voices, we'll sing all four verses together. service in prayer right after he prays welcome one another to the service this evening brother john Amen. Welcome one another this evening.
Again, wanted to ask you to pray especially for our youth group, the Sturgises, as they head to the wilds, New England, to the wilds tomorrow, leaving out early tomorrow morning. If you are going on that trip, uh, where do you want to meet with them, Brother John? Just right up front? Okay, so if you're going to the wilds tomorrow, uh, if you want to just meet right up here, do the parents need to meet as well? Okay, just those going on the trip, just right right after the uh, service this evening. All right, let's continue singing 411 for our offertory hymn. 411, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Why don't we sing verses 1, 2, and 4? 1, 2, and 4. You can remain seated as we sing 411. <laughs> Brother Mike, Greg, would you pray and thank the Lord for the offering this evening, sir? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for that promise that we have through Christ, that he is the solid rock that we can stand upon. Yes. The one and only Savior of this world, Lord. We just thank you for him and what he has done for each and every one of us. Lord, I ask that you uh, take these monies, that you bless them, and that you multiply them greatly to further your gospel around the corner and around the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. secret what God can do. 459. 459. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Feel that way every time we come together. It's a blessing to be together as 
God's people. Let's stand together. We'll sing all three verses 459. Amen. Good singing this evening. You may be seated. All right, as I mentioned, it's a real blessing and a real joy for us to have the doors with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Brother Micah at this time. And Brother Micah, if you'll come on again, just a real blessing to see you again. Time flies. I mean, to me, it seems like yesterday. But we were figuring it's been 10, maybe 10 years. It's been a while. It's a real blessing to have you. Thank Amen. you, Pastor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, last time I was here, I was just a, a single teenager or almost teenager without any hope of getting married. <laughs> no hope in the world. And uh, But uh, uh, since then, uh, I got to meet Jillian. We got married about six years ago. She came down on a missions trip. Her dad pastors in Arizona. Thank the Lord for missions trips. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, my wife, Jillian, and then uh, we've got Ezekiel is four years old. And then Katie is almost three years old. She'll be turning in July. And then Isaiah, he's the one shrieking back there. <laughs> he's uh, about a year and a half. And uh, four of us, four of the five, have, were born in the same town in Mexico. I tell my wife she's the only white girl in the bunch. You know? <laughs> but, uh, boy, we've just uh, been having a great time on this trip. We're so happy to be with you. And uh, in just a few minutes, we'll show you a few pictures of... Um, uh, what we've been doing in Mexico and what our hope and goal is for the future. But I want to say uh, thank you for your help. You're, you've been a blessing over these years. I was talking to my dad a uh, day before yesterday, and I didn't get to talk to him today. I usually do on Sundays, but I didn't get to talk to him. But he, was, uh, he said to say hi to you and say, say thank you. And uh, I think he wishes he was traveling and I was in Mexico. And <laughs> We're coming to the end of our trip. We've been out about three weeks and we've got two more weeks and we'll be back in Mexico. And we're looking forward to it. When we're down there, we look forward to traveling. Amen. <laughs> and when we're traveling, we want to go home. But uh, I'll, we'll watch this video and then I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in Mexico.
In 2003, the Dorr family stood on a vacant piece of property in the Mayo River Valley near the city of Navajua, Sonora, Mexico. Although they did not know it at the time, this barren land would be the place of God's richest blessings in the Bible. In the years to come, God would create on this spot a place where children at risk could find a refuge, the lost could find a savior, and God's servants could train for the ministry. Having only a vision in their faith, the name Providencia was chosen to claim God's providence in that place. In November of 2005, God led to start Providence Baptist Church with the desire to reach the surrounding Indian villages with the gospel and to provide a training ground for the Institute students. Our church now reaches into 19 villages and 29 of Navajo's colonies. The Lord has been so good. When we started Providence Baptist Church, our heart's desire was to fulfill the Great Commission in this area of Mexico. And then also, we wanted to provide a, a model, a training ground for uh, God's servants that wanted to prepare for ministry. A place where they could come and see a church in action that was growing, that they might be able to model their ministries after. Over the years, God has given us uh, many folks that have trusted the Lord as their Savior, followed through with believers' baptism, and continued on growing in the Lord. A ministry that is very special to us has been the children's homes. We receive children that are at risk due to homes that have been destroyed by Satan. It is a special blessing to see the change that comes in these children's lives after they come into a safe and godly environment. These are the children in our elementary school. The majority of these children are in our orphanage. Niños, ¿qué quieren decirles? Providence Baptist Institute is really a result of the Doors' early church planning ministry. In 1986, the Door family arrived in the Mayo River Valley, and over the next eight years were blessed to establish three churches. These churches produced a second generation of young people who desired to serve the Lord. In the fall of 2002, Providence Baptist Institute was founded. Going forward by faith, God provided to purchase and develop land. Wells were hand dug, land was cleared with machetes, and buildings were begun. Today our students come from five different states, and it is a great joy to us that the majority of them have been saved and called here in our local church. We are so excited to have a part in these young people's future. But not only that, we are amazed by what they are doing right now. Every week they work on bus routes, teach Sunday school classes, make hospital visits, go soul winning, participate in village evangelism, help plant new churches, labor on the grounds, and complete a full class load. Five of the Bible Institute graduates have been American young people that have come from the U.S., all of which are faithfully serving God today. In 2010, Brother Micah and Julian Dorr began to take the Institute students to the mountain town of Alamos to hold open-air services. Alamos Baptist Church was started soon after, and within a few years, God blessed with a nice building. Within a one-hour drive of Providencia, there are over 600 villages and towns that don't have a Bible-preaching church. Our desire is that God would raise up churches in these places as He has done in Alamos. God has placed a burden on our heart to reach these towns and villages with the gospel. Uh, it's Thursday afternoon right now. We have a group of young men in the town of Villa Juarez holding an open-air service. 
There's also a group of young men in a small village by your way out in the farm fields holding an open air service. Uh, the children's home has just finished their visitation downtown. Every Thursday, my wife and I bring a group of young men up to the church that we founded here in Alamos and uh, hold services. Uh, please pray for us that God would use us and our ministry to continue to reach uh, people for Christ, to establish churches, and to see leaders trained for the Lord. Thank you. large farming valley if you take our Bible Institute and our uh, main church there and then draw a circle around that within 40 miles of that uh, of, of our Institute there um, like we said on there there's over 600 villages and towns that don't have a Bible preaching church some of them are very very small and then some are larger towns and uh, our hearts desire is that God would use our Bible Institute and us and that we could continue to reach into these villages um, we're thankful for what God has done in Alamos, but boy, there's a lot of other towns that we can do the very same thing in. And uh, we, we average, we had uh, closer to 30 these last two semesters in the Institute, but we average around 20 uh, students uh, in the Bible Institute and then um, part-time students, another 15 or 20 on top of that. And uh, there's some good young men and ladies in that group. And, I hope that you'll pray for us. I, we appreciate uh, how you've helped us already, but pray for us that uh, God would guide us and uh, really open doors that we could continue to go out into these villages. Uh, we're thankful for something that's happening. Um, um, children that have come into the uh, orphanage are growing up and now entering into the Bible Institute. Boy, that's, that's wonderful to us. What a, what a change. Um, in fact, my, my dad's last prayer letter, and he was telling me um, just two weeks ago, uh, he got to baptize um, David Sr. and David Jr. And that's really exciting. Um, a few years ago, we got four um, kids that came to our orphanage, three um, girls and a boy. And when we call it an orphanage, most of the kids are not orphans. They have parents, but it's some kind of a dangerous situation. And uh, they came to um, the orphanage there. And uh, it's a long story, but the mother and father had separated when the kids were young. And the mother had a new boyfriend, and the new boyfriend was abusive. And long story short ended up killing the mom in front of these kids it was just a terrible situation and uh, and uh, but what a change since the kids came to the orphanage to how they are now and uh, all four of them are saved now and uh, just last uh, like i said two weeks ago my dad got to baptize david which is the boy that came to the orphanage along with his dad david senior and uh, David Sr. began to come to church because of the testimony of his kids. And uh, his niece and nephew come to the church also. And he got saved and he's faithful to church and got baptized and wants to go forward for the Lord. Man, that's, that's exciting. That's what we want to see. And uh, God has been good to us. Um, <laughs> I remember we were starting that church in Alamos. And, you know, we were just kids, me and Jillian. <laughs> I didn't know. We had never done it before, didn't know what we were doing, but uh, we uh, had a burden for Alamos, and so we went and just really picked out a wide spot in the road and began to hold services for kids, just in the evening time, open air services, uh, just a wide spot in the road. We'd set up some benches, and uh, some of the Institute boys would go up with me, and either I would or they would do the preaching, and we did that June, July, August, and uh, 
September and then October, we uh, worked up the courage and started planning our very first service for adults. And uh, I remember I was scared to death. I wasn't sleeping at night. And <laughs> I was so scared, I was so stressed out that my hands started peeling, you know, like a snake would lose its skin. <laughs> it was terrible. And I was thinking, oh, I'm going to fail. And what's the world going to think? Yeah, like they care. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but God is good to us. We, we rented about the ugliest building you can imagine. We got it for $50 a month. And it had been through a fire. And uh, the fire department came and put it out before the roof collapsed, but all the, the beams up there were all pretty burnt. And then it had been through a flood, and uh, up about this high on the wall, you could see the watermark still in the mud. And, uh, and then it had sat vacant for about three years. And we set telephone posts up outside this little building and uh, strung wire around it, and we put 30 light bulbs up on um, on that uh, wire strung around the telephone posts and began to hold services. And, and we began to get a group together and it was exciting, you know, the ranchero music and the dogs and the neighborhood kids throwing rocks and all that stuff. But um, I remember the neighbor lady, or I'm sorry, the landlady um, told us we, uh, she was gonna sell the property and we had two weeks to uh, move off of the property. And so we began to look for property, and the last week, I, I remember I would teach my classes in the morning and then run up to Alamos, and we were just looking all over the place, uh, really anything. And uh, nothing had opened up by that last day of the Sunday. And I remember telling the people, I don't know what we're going to do, pray. I don't know where we're going to meet next Sunday. And uh, that service, Juan Carlos, a police officer in the church, uh, came to me after the service and said, my uncle is selling a piece of property. Let's go look at it. And it was really nice. It was just two doors down from where the church already was. And so the people could, uh, you know, if they wanted to walk, they could keep walking to church. And, uh, and it was a good price. And we put a, a little bit of money down on it. And uh, we set up our telephone posts and strung our wire, and we were excited. We got a piece of property. <laughs> and I remember the very first service, Brother Misael got up. It was about dusk, and he began to lead singing. And we were excited. First service, good group of people on the property. We'd cleaned up the trash and put it in a little pile on one side, and we were excited, you know. But I did not think about something. <laughs> um, as Misael began to lead, the singing and it began to turn dusk. Chickens started to come from all over the neighborhood. <laughs> and I did not think about it, but I had put the pulpit right in front of the neighborhood roosting bush <laughs> for all the chickens. And uh, as we were seeing, all those chickens started to come out from all the neighbors' houses and just all over the neighborhood coming right up to where Misa, and I, I hadn't, I didn't know much about chickens before this, but it's not quiet when they're going to roost in the evening. And they start clucking and carrying on, and uh, they begin to run towards the tree, and they have to get a running start and start flapping because they have to, you know, jump up in there. And, and so they're clack, uh, clucking, and there's so many of them, you really can't hear your hear yourself sing. You know, there's old Misa, Misa he's just ignoring them singing like there's no chickens and they're all coming and, and they all climb up in that tree. And I didn't know this either. I guess once the chickens are in the tree, they start fighting for the best spot in the tree. I guess there's a, a better roosting spot and they're making noise and I'm not exactly sure what happened, but one of the chickens pushed another one of the chickens out of the tree. And as it was falling, it was able to reach up and it grabbed one of the limbs with its claw. And so it was hanging upside down right behind Brother Misael. <laughs> and it was flapping its wings and clucking, trying to get back up into the tree. You know, it looks like Misael's got big furry ears, you know. <laughs> and old Misael, he's just ignoring him, <laughs> singing along. And what, what else can you do? <laughs> and uh, I don't remember if it fell out or if it got back up, but... We had to keep singing until the chickens finally calmed down enough that we could have our service. <laughs> and the next service, we actually had to change our service time 
to let the chickens roost, <laughs> and then we could have our, our service. If there's any story that depicts uh, church planting in Mexico, that's it. <laughs> the first chance we got, we cut down the chicken roosting tree. <laughs> But uh, God's been good to us, and I, we really do. We want to see God work, and uh, we'd like to see more churches established in the area. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn to John chapter 6 this evening. John chapter number 6, um, a very well-known passage of Scripture. Uh, this is the feeding of the 5,000, John chapter 6. And uh, to get started, we'll read... Uh, Verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> John chapter 6, and verse number 1. The Bible says this, and um, maybe just to set the stage, it, it uses these three words to get started. It says, after these things. And if we look at um, the other Gospels and we see what's going on, one of the things that has just happened is that uh, John, the, John the Baptist has just been beheaded. And uh, I would imagine that the disciples are, <laughs> you know, this is, um, they're stressed out about this. They don't know what's going to happen. Are they next? Is this going to turn into a, a large persecution? And there's got to be a lot of things going through their mind. And Jesus calls them apart. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And then verse 6 really gives us uh, an understanding why Jesus was doing this. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. He's, he's asking for a reason here. He's proving his disciples. And, and surely this is in the word of God to teach us something also. There's a reason that this is here. He's, he's teaching a lesson uh, I just got done reading the book of John. What a great book it is. But I had never done this before. I went through and underlined, and this is really neat. You underline every time the word believe is in the book of John. And it really opened up to me what a great book this is. And all the apostle uh, John is doing here, he, he's, he, it's written that we might believe that he is the son of God. And just in this, this, this chapter alone, I see, uh, I think, nine times that the word believe is used. Believe, believe. And, and he's teaching us. We see here a remedy to great problems. We see the problem here in uh, verse number five. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence? Shall we buy bread that all these may eat? A great problem. Think of that great need, the great problem. 5,000. And Philip says, there's no way. There's no physical way. The great need, the great problem. And he's going to show us the remedy, the supply to all the great problems and needs. The, the answer to the problem here we find in verse number 9. There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? So we see a great need. Here's the, here's the problem. Here's the need. And we're going to find the remedy to the need. I think that he's giving us a formula for the great problems and needs in the Christian life. Don't we have needs and problems sometimes? I know this country does, amen. <laughs> you know, a great need, a great problem. World evangelism. It just seems overwhelming that all people might hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. It just seems impossible. And uh, we can take any need, any problem. What's the remedy to the great needs around us? 
And then he takes us and he shows us this lad. Five little barley loaves and two small fishes. And the answer to the great need is a surrendered heart from this young man. The answer to the great needs and the great problems is that God's people would surrender themselves to the Lord. And, and we find in this that God supplies. It, it seems impossible. Philip says this. He says, mm, verse number nine, but what are these among so many? We see what God is calling us to do. We say, it seems impossible. What are these among so many? Five little barley loaves and two small fishes. How is that enough for the problem? But God wanted to take the little bit that this lad had, and he wanted to multiply it. And we find that what the lad had when it was in the master's hands was enough to supply the great need and the great problem. What's the, if we're honest with ourselves, each and every one of us would say, there's some kind of something in my life that's out of control. There's something that I, I can't get victory over on my own. Maybe it's just the ministry God has called us to. How many times we've said, or I've said, Lord, I can't do that. <laughs> but what he's asking for is that we would give him what we have. The boy gave him what he had, and God used the little that he had to supply the need. We think of giving, and we think of this. We think of dollars and cents, and, uh, and, and that's part of it. But isn't that a shallow way of thinking? Isn't what God wants more than anything else a surrendered heart? Isn't, if God has our heart, then he has our time, and he has our abilities, and he has our ambition, he has our money. What God wants more than anything else is that his people would be surrendered, would say, I'll give, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Um, I believe this. I believe that when this lad gave his five barley loaves and two small fishes, he was giving all he had. And I believe that it was a symbol of something more. I think that if he had had more, he would have given more. I think that when he gave all he had, what he was showing is a surrendered heart to the Lord. I'll do all I can. I'll do what I can for you. And that's really what God's looking for. This boy had a decision to make. I've got a lunch. It's my lunch. And it was his lunch. I can use my lunch for me, or I can use my lunch for him. <laughs> I can give it to him. And you know, that's really the decision that you and I make every day of our lives, isn't it? I've got a life to live. I've got another day to live. Am I going to live for me? Or am I going to give it to him? Am I living for him? What is the answer? It's when this lad gave the little that he had. I want you to see what happened. When this lad gave the little that he had to the Lord, some things happened. Look at verse number 9 with me. I'm sorry, verse number 11. The Bible says, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes. Look at this phrase now. I like this phrase. As much as they would. That's a good Baptist phrase, amen? <laughs> they sat around eating till they started popping buttons off their shirt, amen? <laughs> as much as as they would. That, that's really remarkable when you think about it. 5,000, and it says men. And it, it could have just been 5,000. It could have been, you know, where there's men, there's women and children. It could have been 10,000. It could have been more than that. A great multitude. If it had just been 5,000, five little loaves, and I think they were small loaves, and two small fishes. I think this was a lunch for a lad. And I think it was a lunch. I, you know, <laughs> it never calls it a lunch, but I, I like to think of it as that. That this could be sufficient for that. Something impossible had to happen. And the Lord Jesus Christ took it and he multiplied it. The impossible 
was accomplished. And this little lad gave what he could to the Lord, the little that he had. How do we see the impossible accomplished in our life? Oh, we do. We want to see the impossible accomplished. How do we see the impossible accomplished? I think of our little church in Mexico, uh, in Alamos. And, uh, you know, (laughs) the guy in front, he can, where people sit, and they always sit in the same place. You can look over the auditorium, you can think who sits here and who sits here. And you can look over the auditorium, and I think of the different people. And it seems like all of them, or 90% of them, or 80% of them, are in some kind of an impossible situation. I think of a couple, and what, their boys are just into all kinds of stuff, and it's, it's breaking their heart. I think of a lady that her husband has quit coming to church, and it's, uh, we found out that he's involved in <laughs> some stuff. I think of a family. And uh, I think of a lady that sits back here that just lost her son. And uh, we all kind of knew it. He was involved in the mafia. And uh, recently he just disappeared. And we all know what happened. And uh, he's just gone. Just all these impossible situations. I think of people that just have some kind of a, a sin problem, just can't get victory over. How do we see victory in impossible situations. I think of health problems and money problems. I think if, you know, I don't know, but I would imagine that there are problems in this room. How do we get victory in these impossible problems, these impossible situations? This is the tendency. We're in a problem and we say, I need to focus on me right now. And and, and the tendency is this, for the Christian to step back from the things of the Lord. And we say, uh, I can't serve God right now. Right now, I'm going to fix my problem. And when my problem is fixed, then I'll get right with the Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll begin to serve Him again. But that's not right. <laughs> that's not right. Uh, God asks that we give Him our all. We surrender and we live for Him. And somehow in the surrender, when we're living for him, God accomplishes the impossible. You know, there's a phrase in the book of Acts, the Bible uh, says, and great grace was given to them. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Great grace, great help. You know when great grace was given to the apostles? It was when they had been preaching, and then they were thrown into the prison. And the next day, God asked them to go boldly and preach again. And when they began to go, great grace was given to them. You know when great grace, great help is given? When we need it. <laughs> when we give ourselves and we give it all we can and, and, and then God uses it and accomplishes the impossible. You know, in the Bible, there are only two times that the words great victory are used together. Great victory. And one of those times is when Eliezer stayed. And the other men of Israel began to run. And he stood his ground and he began to fight. Amen. I think that he was going to give his life there that day. I think that he didn't expect to live. But he was just going to fight and do what he could. And he began to fight. And and literally he was laying down his life. And he fought. And his hand Clave to the sword. And the Bible says that that day great victory was given to them. The Bible says that the soldiers returned to the spoil. How do we see the great victories, the great problems solved, great grace? It's when we're surrendered to God, we're doing what we can for the Lord, and, and God helps us. That it just seems impossible to us. Down in Mexico, <laughs> down in Mexico, we uh, come down from Alamos, and uh, you can buy hot dogs. We're famous for hot dogs in Mexico. You can get them for about fifty or sixty cents a hot dog. And I don't know if you had them for the free when you're down, but uh, they take that bun and they warm it up in the butter, and then they uh, they take a hot dog and wrap it in bacon and fry it and put it in there. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and then they put tomatoes and mayonnaise on top of that. And then they take grilled 
onions are put in there. If you go to the good places, they'll put ham and cheese in there with it. And then they'll put mayonnaise, or, I'm sorry, ketchup and mustard, and then they hand it to you and send you to a condiments bar. And you go over there and then you put your guacamole on top of that and the cucumbers with soy sauce on top of that. If it's a good place, you put the bacon bits on top of that. And they hand this thing to you and it's good. And uh, if you're a good eater, you can eat two of them. <laughs> and I had uh, brought the boys back and we were getting hot dogs. And I said, boys, I was happy. I said, boys, eat all you can tonight. They went through the first time. And they went through the second time. And they went through the third time. And I said, guys, that's enough. <laughs> and one guy went on his own dime. And he ate seven hot dogs at the hot dog place. Teenagers <laughs> or young men. Can you imagine... You know, we think of these Bible numbers sometimes, but you think there were some teenagers in that crowd? Five barley loaves and two small fishes. And it fed the multitude. 5,000. It, it just seemed like an impossible situation. But God accomplished the impossible. And this lad was willing to give what he had, the little that he had to the Lord. And that's really all God's asking of us, to give what we have, I look, think of it as who we are. And when we're willing to give the little that we have, God can accomplish the impossible. When we give the little that we have, God wants to use it to satisfy the multitudes. Look at verse 12 with me. When they were filled. Why was the multitude filled? Because this lad was willing to give his lunch to the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus multiplied it. And the multitude was satisfied. And maybe, maybe we don't see it as often as we want. Maybe, maybe it's not on our timetable. But I, I, I guarantee, I promise you this, that if we're living surrendered lives to the Lord, God wants to and will use our lives to satisfy people around us. There's people at work. There's family members that aren't saved. There's neighbors, and they need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And God wants to save them. God wants to use us. But what he needs before he can do that, what he wants, is a surrendered heart. It's, it's a surrendering. It's a giving of ourselves to him. Uh, May 24th we, uh, was the day before we came up here, and uh, we had graduation from the Bible Institute. And uh, Brother Jesus graduated from the Bible Institute. He has seven kids, and his wife works in the Christian school, and uh, Brother Jesus is a blessing. Uh, but a while back, Jesus and Griselda had uh, gone home. They live off campus and uh, gone to bed, and in the early hours of the morning, two or three in the morning, they got a knock on the door. Griselda um, confessed that she was a little bit irritated that somebody would be knocking at their door in the early morning hours. But they got up out of bed and answered the door. And the neighbor lady was standing at the door. And she said, uh, she asked them, she said, I know you're Christians. I, I know you go to church. I've seen your kids. My husband is sick. Would you come over to my house and talk to my husband? He's very sick with cancer. And uh, so they did. They they got dressed and uh, went over and they sat around the kitchen table at the neighbor's house. And uh, uh, they talked with the man for about a half hour and then the man bowed his head and accepted Christ as a savior. And uh, sitting there in the mor early morning hours, they were just kind of talking about different things, light subjects. And the man just uh, put his head down on his hand. And uh, they didn't think a lot about it, kept talking. And then he just kind of bowed his head and passed on to eternity, and went to heaven. Amen? <laughs> but really, it was because there was a Christian family living a surrendered life to the Lord. And God was able to use their testimony and their life. And this man is in heaven. God wants to use us to satisfy the multitudes. But before he can, he, he, we've got to be surrendered We've got to be given to what he wants us to do. The little that we have, that we could use it and give it to the Lord, ask him to use it. 
He wants to accomplish the impossible, satisfy the multitudes. And one more verse, and I'm done. And he wants to use it to multiply blessings in our lives. Verse number 12, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. And therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Now think about this with me. This is profound, I think. This young man must have been surprised when he gave his lunch away and still ate his lunch. <laughs> we get it wrong sometimes. We think that I'm going to live for God and I'm going to miss out on life. But the truth is, this boy gave it and then ate it. And I think this boy ate more of his lunch than he would have if he had kept his lunch. Isn't that good? <laughs> uh, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. And the truth is this, that the best that we can have is give our life to the Lord, and he gives us that abundant life and the blessings it is. He ate his lunch, he ate more of his lunch. And I've, I know you've probably heard different ideas about this, and this is just an idea, but what happened to the fragments? <laughs> I'll give you my translation, and we'll get to heaven, and you'll realize that I'm right. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> and when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. And therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto, unto them that had eaten. I think it went like this. He goes home and he says, Mama, look what I've got. <laughs> and uh, mom comes to the front porch and looks out and uh, she says, boy, where'd you get all that food? There's 12 disciples with 12 baskets full of food. Where'd you get all that food? I gave my lunch to Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. It, it makes sense to me that it was his lunch. Well, it just seems like the fragments would be his. I, uh, but I think the principle is there in, in Scripture that give and it shall be given. And this boy gave the little that he had, and he saw the Lord Jesus multiply it. He saw great blessings because he gave what he had to the Lord. And the truth is this, I can, I can testify to it in my family, and I think what I see in the lives of other men and women of God, that the greatest, the best that we could ever have is when we're living for the Lord, amen? amen. The most joy, the most satisfying. I think of uh, a student, and he's almost exactly my age. Uh, he um, was saved when he was like, 20 or 21, and uh, then was baptized, and then surrendered his life to the ministry and uh, came into the Bible Institute when he was 22 years old, 21 or 22. And uh, we treat our Bible Institute, um, we don't think of it so much as a Bible college, we think of it as a team of young people that can train for the ministry. And so we really have some strict rules for these uh, young men and young ladies that come in. One of the rules is that, um, and, um, is that in the first years, and I know this is <laughs> strict, in the first years they're not allowed to date or have a girlfriend. Or, we want them to focus on the studies and the institute in the first years, and then with permission later on, you know, um, as the Lord leads. And so, you know, what does a 22-year-old young man, what is he more interested in to finding a wife, amen? <laughs> but he came into the Bible Institute and he put, you could say this, that for a while he put aside what he wanted and he was living for the Lord. I think he probably went home on the weekends and his mama said, Chewy, you're getting old. <laughs> you got to get married, Chewy. But he was, he was doing well, he was faithful. And uh, we began to rise um, in authority. We put him over the boys' dorm. And then later on, he became a bus captain. And uh, 
one day, and I don't know if it was him or one of the people with him, but they were out door knocking for the bus route, and they knocked on the door of a young lady. <laughs> and she came to church and was saved and later was baptized and later joined the Bible Institute. And uh, Chewie and Margot began to notice each other. Amen. <laughs> and about a year and a half ago, Chewie and Margot got married. And uh, Chewie and Margot uh, worked in the orphanage for a while. Now they're living off campus. In fact, Chewie and Margot are covering, covering services in Alamos for me and Jillian while we're gone. And uh, they're doing well. Now I think about this. I think about this. If Chewie hadn't um, put his life on hold for a while to serve God, if he had only been living for his desires and what he wanted, I'm just sure that he wouldn't have the great wife that he has now. And, and really, it happened because he was willing to put God first in his life. And God took care of him. And God's multiplying blessings. And it's not just one blessing to have a, a godly wife. It's blessings upon blessings for the rest of his life. And it's far greater than what he could have had if he was just living for himself. And this is the truth. This is the truth. God wants to multiply blessings. But before he can multiply the great blessings in our lives, he needs a surrendered heart. Amen. The, a, a, a life that puts God first before he can accomplish the impossible, before he can satisfy the multitudes, before he can multiply blessings. He's just looking for a surrendered heart. And really, it's something that we decide to do every day. Lord, let me live for you today. Lord, what do you want me to do today? And so easy it is to grow cold. So easy it is to focus on me. <laughs> And, but let us keep God first, that God can do what he wants to do in our lives. Pastor. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Micah. It was a tremendous challenge. Thank you for that. Let's take our hymnals to 390. 390. You know, what he spoke on tonight is the key. It really is. You're just willing to surrender. Then the Lord will take you and use you and bless you in ways that you never even imagined. And as he was preaching tonight, I was reminded, you know, it's not our ability it's our availability that's what the Lord's looking for and if we'll just simply surrender to him why don't we stand together 390 and sing that first verse together the altar is open any way the Lord has spoken to your heart if you want to respond tonight as we sing <laughs> 